Hello and welcome to another recorded author chat at the Poison Pen Bookstore. I'm John Charles and we're delighted to welcome back, even if it's only virtually, author Laura Bradford. Laura is here today to talk about her latest book, A Plus One for Murder, as well as some of her previous titles. But before we get started, I do want to let those tuning in know that we have copies of A Plus One for Murder at the Poison Pen, and we would be happy to hold one for you at the store or put one in the mail. Just go online or give us a call and we can get that out to you right away. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome Laura Bradford. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, excited to be back with Poison Pen, even though I have to do it remotely. <laughs> yes, we'll take what we can get right now. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm always fascinated by who the author was before they were a writer. So can you talk a little bit about yourself before you officially became a writer? Well, um, I guess before it, um, I was a newspaper reporter right out of college, and I had some very interesting jobs. I was a civilian reporter for the Navy-based newspaper in Charleston. Um, I was a lifestyle editor in Troy, Alabama. Uh, I was a features editor uh, in St. Charles and St. Peter's, Missouri. And then uh, once I had my children, I just decided it was time to finally write the fiction I'd always wanted to write. So that was kind of where I was before book, the book world. Took over. Well, early on, you kind of had an idea about your writing career because didn't you get your first rejection letter when you were like 10? I did. I did. I'd written a, a children's book. I illustrated the pictures, wrote the story, and I sent it off. I believe, I, I think Hoffman Mifflin, Mifflin was one of them. And I got a very nice rejection letter, but it was a rejection letter nonetheless. So um, I was crushed, of course, mm -hmm. but um, it didn't, I didn't let it sway me. I just knew one day, one day I was going to see my name on a book and uh, I've done that. So yeah. what was your initial path to publication like for that first book? First book was a series called the Jenkins and Burns Mysteries. And I did not have an agent at that time. And I found what was, I guess, an independent, small independent press um, out of Maryland who was looking to uh, pick up series with strong women pr protagonists. And so I sent it to them and uh, they liked it, but they wanted some work done on it. And at first it took, took almost six months for me to kind of wrap my head around what they wanted me to do with it. And uh, I finally did it, sent it back in and um, they published it. So that was exciting. That was my first path, my first way in. And then that actual book, which was called Jury of One at that time was an Agatha nominee. And it's how I got my agent. So that was uh, that was the start of things for me. And then I got in with Penguin Publishing and the rest is history. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about your new book, A Plus One for Murder. Plus One for Murder. That one kind of came back, came about in an interesting way. Um, it's a, I think it's during the pandemic and, and we realized that we have, we really had to rely on the virtual world to keep in touch with people. That was one aspect. And then, you know, sometimes we get so used to that that we start stop kind of reaching out to people in person. And it leaves us with some dilemmas. There are times where you do have to have people with you in person. Uh, that was one aspect. Another aspect was my youngest daughter um, had a coworker who moved from Texas to New York City as a young girl. And I thought that was very daunting. How would you meet friends in a place as big as New York City? And I found out from her, they actually have much like dating apps, they have friend apps, oh. which was kind of neat. And you can put in things that you're interested in doing. Maybe you like book clubs, maybe you're a runner, maybe um, you're into bowling and you go through this app and it's, it kind of pairs you up with other people looking for friends interested in the same thing. So I found that kind of a fascinating little tidbit. And it was probably shortly after that conversation with my daughter that it just, it came to me, I thought, how neat would that be for a cozy mystery to have someone's job be a friend for hire for those people maybe who, you know, have a lot of friends virtually and don't necessarily have in flesh and blood live people that they can go to events with or do things with. And this would be this woman's job that she could be someone's wingman um, at a senior citizen dance or she could be, you know, eventually go to a wedding with somebody who doesn't want to show up alone, that kind of thing. And I thought, well, this is genius. So it would get her in front of a lot of, with a lot of people in a lot of different situations. And so 
that's what I, uh, I, uh, how I started this. And um, Emma, my main character, that's what she does. She's going to be hireable to go to things with people and to be their friend, be an accountability partner, be a workout buddy. And so it's allowed me to, to start to build a really fun cast of supporting characters that are her friends, but to also to bring in new people that she meets that could potentially be victims and suspects, et cetera. So, yeah. Um, your protagonist, Emma, kind of is her one of her her previous careers kind of collapsing because she was a travel agent and that industry went through so many changes. Right. So now she's branching out. Um, and even though if, if you're not, you might be new to the idea, it sounds kind of um, out there, I guess, people hiring friends, but there's really some historical precedents for it. Um, women in the 19th century used to be companions to right. women. And I guess in a lot of um, maybe the bigger cities like New York City and things, I've read where wealthy widows, wealthy women who didn't have um, someone in their life to take them to the opera or to social events would hire, I guess, men they called walkers. That, and that right. was their job, just to take them out. So you're kind of building on, it's not completely out right. there. There's some precedent for it. Um, right. I thought it was interesting. I don't know whether it was um, just lucky coincidence or whether you were really kind of doing this on an intuitive level, but your book, A Plus One for Murder, is a lot about underneath the mystery and things about human connection. And we're going yes. through a time when people are not able to connect. So right. is that something you really wanted to explore in the book? Absolutely, because I was just aware. And when this conversation happened and when this book started, when I first pitched this book uh, to my agent, it was right at within the first six weeks of the pandemic starting. And at least in New York, I mean, everything shut down. Um, my daughter and I actually went to go stay in a relative's um, cottage because my husband um, was a, is a or was a, a police officer at the time, and and he was around the public, and it was just became a little bit a little bit nerve wracking. So it was, you know, once she and I were down there, everything that we had was either by Zoom. You know, I got kept in touch with my children with Zoom, and um, and yeah, you just realized just how much you miss of the human interaction. It was nice to be able to have Zoom and, and face, you know, um, FaceTime and all those things accessible. That would have been very difficult without it. I can't imagine what it must have been like during the Spanish flu. Mm -hmm. But that said, it just made you realize just how important that human connection is, the hug, the, mm -hmm. the being able to see people sitting across from you at a, co at a coffee table, you know, so. Yes, absolutely. That was that was a part in my mind, um, kind of driving behind this book. Now, uh, most of your mysteries, including a plus one for murder, are marketed as cozy mysteries. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of, um, for those listening in, tell us what that means to you and what you think a, a successful cozy mystery needs in terms of okay. ingredients? Sure. Um, well, I think the 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 traditional part of the cozy mystery is the fact that it's an amateur sleuth. It's an everyday person who has an everyday job and they come across, you know, um, a situation, a murder, a dead body, and, and for whatever reason, they have to solve it. What I like about Emma in this book is that she's a reluctant sleuth. I know myself, if I came across, um, a dead body, I wouldn't be necessarily all enthusiastic about getting into that because it's just, it's it's above my pay grade. Um, I'm, I'm a, uh, a more easygoing person, something like that might scare me. Um, so I kind of feel her reluctance and why she's not all too excited about solving that, helping to solve this, but why the people surrounded around her are. Um, the other thing is it's always a small town, so you feel like you can picture this town. It's the kind of street you'd want to walk down, the kind of people that you'd want to get to meet. Um, and all the, any of the, the murder aspect happens off the page, which is nice. So we've had enough uh, trauma in the world, and it's nice to, to kind of leave that off to the side and just explore the whodunit aspect. Like the way Agatha Christie did and so many other greats. Um, you mentioned that Emma has a couple of partners in her mm -hmm. detective efforts. And I thought it was really um, clever the way one of them 
is very much an advocate for cozy mysteries and she's kind of um, pushing at Emma's preconceptions about the genre. And you also kind of give her the, that character the chance to promote a series by a certain author too. Right. Is that fun to do? <laughs> It was, it was very fun having that aspect. And I thought that that makes it more realistic why this particular character, Dottie, is really into wanting to solve it because she's an avid reader of Cozy Mysteries and she's always been the armchair sleuth along with her favorite characters. And now here all of a sudden, she has the opportunity to, to help solve a real crime. So she's very excited about that and doesn't really understand why Emma um, isn't so excited. So I, I just had a lot of fun with that dynamic. Dottie's also an older woman, and I have always enjoyed writing older characters. I think they're fun. They're a wealth of information. Um, very often they don't have a filter, which makes them fun. And uh, we just, they're fun to learn from and just fun to, fun to play off. So this was, this was an opportunity for me to, to, to get back into that with the different age ranges. Yeah, the murder victim is someone who, um, I guess you'd call him a small town journalist or aspiring journalist who's involved in investigating things. Did you right. kind of draw upon your own uh, newspaper background and thinking about bit. what he could do? Yeah, a little bit. I, that was fun. I always like to kind of, when I have an opportunity, bring in that newspaper background because while um, a tiring job, it, it does, it, it gives you a lot of experience on a lot of different things and you meet a very interesting cast of characters. Um, so yes, I definitely feel that Brian was someone, maybe a little bit, a combination of some people I've met along the way, maybe who were really always interested in digging up the dirt mm -hmm. in a story, maybe when there wasn't really necessarily dirt or maybe there was, so yeah. Now this is the launch to a new series for you, Plus One for Murder. You've written several other um, mystery series, um, including the Desert Emergency uh, Squad series, the Amish series. Do you always know when you're going in how long the series is going to run? Can you kind of think ahead to what you want, book two and three? Can you talk a little bit about writing a series from a mystery right. writer's perspective? Um, I think sometimes it's hard to know how long you get because sometimes that's dictated beyond our level. Um, sometimes the publisher, you know, maybe maybe they're backing out of cozies or they're shrinking their line or whatever. So sometimes you don't know that a series is wrapping up when you write a uh, and what ends up being a final book and you don't get to wrap it up the way you want. But I, I knew with my Sewing Circle book that I wrote as Elizabeth Lynn Casey, I knew the 12th book, we were wrapping that up. And so I was able to send those characters off in a way that I hoped would satisfy the readers who had followed me all along those 12 books. But yet you also always want to, or at least for me, I want to also leave the, the reader with a, um, an opportunity to major, maybe imagine something that they want also. So that's kind of fun. Maybe a character, we know they're gonna have a baby at the end of the last book but we don't necessarily say what gender it's gonna be. So they let, let them kind of imagine that. That's kind of fun. Um, the Amish series, I knew, uh, actually I did not know the Killer Carol, that was the end, but yet I feel like I wrapped it up in a good place. Um, so you just hope, I think with each book, you wanna leave a little bit of something for them to wanna keep reading, but at the same respect, you also want to leave the characters in a good place with each at the end of each seer at the end of each book so that if and when that ends up being the case they still feel good about it so at least that's what I try to do now as you are writing series I know some authors kind of keep I guess a book or a bible whatever they call it because they're creating these worlds right and they want to remember like does this character have blue eyes is the coffee shop on main street because right. readers will catch you when yes you they will <laughs> so that's your approach you just kind of um, go with the flow and hope things work out well I always I do keep a um, an index file and I keep my cards in there and I with all the little details of the characters and and my goal as a writer is, 
when I introduce characters, I want, I want to give you a feel for them. I want you to feel good about them, but I don't want to tell you everything about them from the very first book. I want to build on that. Like real friendships, we don't know everything about the person that we think is a nice person until we get to know them a little while. So as this series continues, as all of my series, you know a little bit more about each character with each book. So I keep track of that on all of my, on my index cards and I pull them out before I start each book. Um, and, I, and I know where I want them to go, but sometimes when I sit down to write a book, I think I know exactly what's gonna happen, but the characters kind of tell me otherwise. And to me, that's the most fascinating part of being a writer is when the characters start to become so real that they want to tell the story the way they want to tell the story. And sometimes they surprise me. That kind of sounds like you're describing your writing process because I know some character or some authors are very really tightly structured. Others kind of just write and see what happens. What's your own approach when you're setting down to write a book? Do you... um, I, always, I always know for the most part who did it and why. Um, it's the like the side stories that kind of kind of happen I might have an idea but they kind of un unfold on their own which I love um, the fascinating part for me with the process that I've seen many times so I don't think it's just a fluke it with this is that maybe I'll get two-thirds into the writing process and I'll think wow this might have been a, a, a fun little aspect to do and so I will build it in for the final third of the book with the intention that when I go back to edit I will weave it into the first two thirds. And more times than not, when I go to do that, I find that it's already there. I wasn't conscious that I was doing it until two thirds of the way into the book. And to me, I think that's, that's one of those things that just, I don't know, it's exciting. Now, in addition to mysteries, you also write what the market calls women's fiction, mm -hmm. I guess. Can you tell us a little bit about those books? Right, um, that kind of came from having written the Amish mysteries that I had, that series. Um, I was fascinated by the aspect, my, my uh, detective in that series, Jacob Fisher, was former Amish. Um, and when he wanted, he, he left after baptism and so he was shunned um, and he's a police officer and he comes back to the town where he grew up and that's where he's going to be the, be a detective. And the Amish don't make it necessarily easy for him because they, they've shunned him. They've turned their back on him. He left his vows. And so I can explore that and did in the background of all of those books. But I also wanted to explore it even deeper than I did. But with a mystery, a mystery has to be central. So I kind of came up with this idea for my first women's fiction um, novel, Portrait of a Sister to explore that aspect, and I did it through twin sisters, one who left before baptism, one who is faced with the decision about leaving after baptism, and how it's very different, the consequences are very different, depending on when you leave, and I enjoyed writing that book so much that I kept on going, and then I ended up having three more um, Amish-based women's fiction, which is a tough market in the sense that, um, uh, I think a lot of women's fiction readers don't necessarily pick up Amish-based fiction. They don't necessarily think that it's going to equate to them, whereas when people have given these books a chance, I think they realize that they are broad-reaching and it doesn't, the Amish is just a backdrop, but anybody can relate to them. But that's been a struggle. Um, Linda Castillo has done an amazing job, amazing job, making that bridge between thrillers and the Amish, so much so that thriller readers want to pick those books up and read them regardless of whether they have a thing for Amish fiction or not. So uh, hats off to her. She's done a great job. I think you're right. There is a, there's a dedicated group of readers that will definitely read Amish fiction, mm -hmm. histories, historicals, whatever, but they don't always translate into a wider readership with general readers. Um, but I, what there are people who are just fascinated by that world and that culture, what do you think it is about the Amish that is so intriguing? I think it's the simplicity, um, the fact that they live almost like late 1800s, but yet they're doing it with a modern world around them. And I think that's kind of 
intriguing. I think it reminds us of a simpler time, maybe that we envy a little bit. Um, but the thing is that 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 makes these women's fiction books in particular, I think, appealing to whether you like to read Amish fiction or not, is that people need to realize, although that there are some differences, I mean, they're still just people just like the rest of us. They still have hurts, they still have joys, they still have fears, and it, it is similar. It's just a backdrop, you know, that in those particular books I chose to use. Now you've written more than 35 books, perhaps even more than that. As you look back over your career, what have you learned about publishing as a writer that you wish you had known when you were first starting out? <laughs> um, a lot of it is just have fun with it. Um, there's so much stuff when you're, when you're first published, you think about all these things that you can do and you make your postcards and you do all these things and you can certainly help with that aspect. But the most important thing is just to write a good book so that your readers then you know, word of mouth. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing um, is just keep writing, write, 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 and just realize that there's only, only so much of it is in your control. And uh, the thing that is in your control is writing the best book that you can write in that moment. Um, you mentioned uh, tangentially marketing through bookmarks mm -hmm. and things like that. How does, what role does social media now play in your life as an author? And is there a particular platform or platforms that you gravitate towards? Right. I absolutely think social media, just in, in terms of keeping in touch with your readers. Um, there's a lot of people that I've met at signings that I've kind of built a fun friendship with because of social media. It's a great place to get out your books, um, but to also do, to let your reader see you as a human. That's my biggest thing. I'm, I'm, I'm not one to push my book every week, every, you know, constantly, constantly. When I have a book coming out, the days leading up to it, weeks leading up to it, yes, the weeks lead afterward. But I also wanna just talk about the fact that I'm building a new house or I wanna show a picture of my cat or I just think it makes us, you know, I mean, that's what I am. I'm a person first who happens to be a writer. So um, I gravitate toward Facebook, absolutely. I have my Facebook author page, I love that. I have a um, a private group for my readers, people who are avid Laura Bradford readers can join that. Um, I like Instagram. I'm mostly though I get lost looking at everybody's pictures and forget to post one of my own. Um, and I was on Twitter. I'm still technically on Twitter, but I don't do anything on there. I just, it's not my platform. So I would say Facebook is my biggie followed by Instagram. It's interesting because your new book is all about connection and social media is a way to connect back to your readers. Yeah, yeah, it is. I, I, I enjoy that. And I hope that, um, you know, people feel the connection and the importance of a good friendship. And I just read a review on the book um, from, from uh, Mark Baker with Carstairs Considers is one of my go-to cozy author, um, cozy book reviewers. And he said that, that ultimately, uh, beyond the mystery in this book, the, the main factor is just that human connection. And I think, especially right now with the way the world has been and is still, still is in many ways, that we all just need that, that connection. And I think that that's what really spoke to me in the writing. And that's what I'm hoping will speak to the readers as well. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit. I have something that you had said um, reading has always been a trusted friend in your life, but that changed during the pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about how you got back on track that period right. as a reader back to reading and then maybe some things you've read that you'd like to share with other readers? Absolutely. It is interesting. I, I, during the pandemic, I don't know if it's because I stopped going to the, the gym, which is where I used to do my reading while I was on the elliptical machine. I'd, I'd have my book and I would read, read, read. And because everything was closed, I didn't have that time. Um, and I just think there was so much noise in my head, so much worry, um, worry about everything, worry about my family, worry about my health, worry about what was gonna happen. So I found it hard to settle my brain down enough to read. Um, but I kind of forced myself, I kind of got back into working out a little bit and made myself sit down. I went for some of my, my tried and true favorite authors who are the ones that can always bring me back. 
And once I got back into that, it was, it was, it was a reminder that that's always my, my escape place, my happy escape place. And it was okay to escape again during everything that was going on. Um, as for books that I've read most recently that I love, um, I'm a big, I found Kristen Higgins first through her book. Um, I think it's, it's as good as it gets, good as it gets. Mm -hmm. Good, no, no, great. Good with that. Good with that. Good with that. Um, yeah. I absolutely love that book. That one spoke to me. I, as soon as I finished reading it, I went back and read it again. I've read it probably four or five times, but that got me onto reading her books. So the most recent one of hers I read was her new book. I think it came out in the spring, Pack Up the Moon, which I loved. Mm -hmm. um, I read all of Harlan Coben's books. I thought his book, Win, the one that came out this year, um, I thought that was his best of all of his books. And I've nice. loved most, I've loved it, all of his books, but I thought that one was fantastic. And then Linda Castillo, she's, she's probably my favorite author. I have her date circled in July of her book that comes out every single year. And the interesting thing is the book that came out during the pandemic year, so 2020, I had been so excited to read that, but because I kind of lost my, my mojo with reading, it sat um, for a long time. And that's how I, that was really the one that got me back in again. I was like, you know what? If, if Linda can't pull me out of this, nobody can. So I read her book. And then, then by the time I finished that, it was time for her latest one, which I think was Forgotten, I think was the most recent. Yeah, forgotten. So, yeah. And I love that. So, and then that was really what got me reading again after I got back into, into my mojo compliments of her. Then I started seeking out Harlan's book and Kristen's latest. So, yeah. Um, what's next for you as a writer? What can we expect? Hmm, what's next? Um, well, the second book in the series has been written and it's the, got the cover. It's called A Perilous Pal and it will be out on July 5th. So there'll be more adventures with Emma and Dottie and Scout and the whole crew. Um, I have both a women's fiction book I wrote a long time ago that's more like a, mm, a suspense, kind of with a suspense edge that is not Amish based that I wrote a while ago and kind of tucked aside until I would have the time to go back and, and readdress it. So that's on my plan for the first of the year, as is a thriller I once wrote that I think has very strong possibilities, but I have always known that it needed more work. Mm -hmm. And so these last few months has been about getting ready to move and building our house and moving to a new state. And it's been a little bit nuts, but I have my, I am going to have a brand new office in my brand new house. And I am going to kick off my time in my new office by getting into those stories as well as writing hopefully more adventures for uh, Emma and the crew uh, if readers fall in love with her, so. Now it's a little bit for a mystery writer to switch to thrillers and suspense. You have to kind of change your, your thinking just a little bit. Is that gonna be a fun challenge or do you? I think it'd be a great challenge. That's one thing I've always, I enjoy writing cozies. Um, I just, I'm a writer first. Um, Cozies is kind of what broke me in, but I also wrote romance along the way. I've written the women's fiction. Um, I, I kind of think I could do it all, but I, I need to just do it. And I need to, and I know it's not easy, but I think that, that um, I can do it. And one of the ways that I always do, I always believe in reading what you want to write. So you kind of get a feel for pacing, for how things are done, what works, what doesn't work. So I've kind of, I read a lot of women's fiction when I was writing my, uh, when I was getting ready to write my uh, Amish-based women's fiction, just to kind of get a feel, make sure that my head was in the right place. Um, and I love to read thrillers just for my own, my own thing. I'm a big Lisa Unger fan also. She's great. So I'm just kind of excited to dip my toe in that and see if I can do it. Because what I have so far is pretty good. It's just not strong enough yet. So I have to see now if I can make it strong. And as there are way readers can learn more about you and your books? Do you have a website? How can they do Absolutely. that? Absolutely. I do. LauraBradford.com. And uh, that's where all you can find about all of my books, mysteries, and women's fiction, um, and my social media links, and, and a little bit about all of the books and backgrounds. So yeah, it's uh, it's fun. And like I said, I'm on my on my author page my and my private group page. Those are pretty much the places where I interact on a daily basis. So yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I can't believe our time is already up. It's just flown by with such an entertaining guest like you, Laura. Um, I'll mention again, Laura's new book is A Plus One for Murder. It is currently out and available at your favorite bookstore or at the Poison Pen if you'd like a copy. And Laura did sign, we have a few book plates for those lucky early people that order them that are included in the book. So I'd like to thank you, Laura, for sharing some time with us. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And I hope that once the world settles down, I can be back out in poison pen in, purpose, in uh, person, so yeah. Thank you, and thank everyone for tuning in for another virtual author event at the Poison Pen Bookstore. Thank you very much. Now, in case I lose you when I start clicking buttons, um, thank you, Lori. You're always a wonderfully entertaining guest. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and I miss seeing you, so I hope to get yeah. out. Is your cozy group coming back together again? It seems like every time we're just about to um, launch, then something yeah. like Delta or Omicron or yeah. I, yeah. Um, right now, I know Barbara was looking at January as uh, kind of reintroducing in person. They've done a few, but not a lot right. in person events. So that we're looking to see how that goes. Right. Um, yeah, it's one of my favorite events ever was the um, the launch of Emergency Dessert Squad with with you with the store yeah. and Jen Sam, Jen Sam, the one yeah. that she was in your group came and she brought that ambulance cake. Remember that? Yeah, that was just amazing. So I have a picture yeah. of that on my website because that was that was incredible. <laughs> um, well, no matter what happens, if we do events in person, you always have an open invitation to come back. Thank you. Thank um, you. And I really well, I appreciate that. So thank you very much. Thank you. I really enjoyed uh, the book. I'll definitely let you um, provide the link and everything once it's ready. And excellent. Good luck excellent. in your new home. Now, are you thank in Maryland you. now, or where are you? South at? Carolina is where we're moving from New York to South Carolina. We have a nice lake lot, and my husband retired as a police sergeant, and we're just going to slow things down a little bit and have more writing time and just you know, a little less hectic. And my last, my youngest daughter just graduated from college and landed a job right away. So mm -hmm. all this good. <laughs> yeah. Good, that's good. Well, yeah. um, that's wonderful to hear. Have a wonderful holiday and I look forward to a bright new year for you and everyone. Thank you very much. You, you as well. Bye, John. Thanks, Laura, bye. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.